and seeking the Lord's blessing, would you please now turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 13 and 14, and particular phrase within verse 14. And so before we hear God's word once again in the reading, let's ask for his blessing in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask for your help. We ask, O Holy Spirit, that you would teach us, that you would lead us in the way of truth. We know that your word is truth. What we are looking at is your infallible, inerrant, inspired, true word given to us for our salvation. And so we ask you to please help us to correctly understand what the scriptures teach us here because we know that this is vitally important for us. Please bless us together, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 13 and 14. Again, God's holy word. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now, this morning, I would like for us to look together at these words found in verse 14, Galatians chapter 3. These words, the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham. I want us to see and understand what the blessing of Abraham is and how is it that you and I can receive the blessing of Abraham. Now certainly this is an important subject to understand because it's the theme of the Bible, really. The blessing of Abraham. How, what is it and how do we receive it? Well first let's think for a moment about what is meant by the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham. Now, you notice that Paul mentions that this is something that is promised in verse 16 of chapter 3. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. So the promises, they are something promised. The blessing is something promised. That, again, is is reinforced in verse 14 where it speaks of the blessing of Abraham that we might receive the promised spirit. In verse 18, again, for if the inheritance comes by law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. What did he give by promise? The inheritance. The inheritance the blessing of Abraham. That's what we're looking at, and that's what we're seeking to understand. What is this inheritance, this blessing of Abraham? Well, if we go back to Genesis chapter 12, and I invite you to turn with me there, then you can see where it is first given. It's first declared to Abraham. Here's where we see it start. In chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 that when God said this to Abraham, Abraham was in fact preaching the gospel. 
in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. But notice what is included in this promise here. First of all, we see that a land is promised, right? The land that I will show you. And then we see that he will be made into a a great nation or a kingdom. And then it is said that he will be a blessing, that in him will be a blessing. And so this is the promise, the covenant that God is making with Abraham. This is the blessing of Abraham. In chapter 13 of Genesis, we see this again, this idea of a land and of offspring. If you look at verse 14, the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. The land that he lifts up and he looks at, he is going to receive and have it forever. Abraham is going to have it forever. Did Abraham, in his lifetime on earth, receive that land? No, he didn't. And yet he's being promised, you're going to have this land forever. I'm going to give it to you and your offspring forever. In chapter 15 of Genesis, after some time, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. Now, the better translation here would be the New King James Version or the NIV Version or the Old King James Version, where God says to Abraham, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. In other words, God himself, I am your reward. I'm your shield and I am your reward. God himself was the reward, the blessing, the inheritance that is being promised to Abraham. Now, the Apostle Paul reaffirms this in Romans chapter 8, which we read earlier. In these striking words, he says this, The Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit, our own hearts, our own minds, that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. In other words, the inheritance is God himself. We are heirs of God. The blessing of Abraham. God himself is the inheritance. God himself is the promised blessing. And this is why in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7, when God gives the sign of his promise, covenant promise, in circumcision, he reaffirms his promise by saying that God is going to be God to you, Abraham. I'm going to be your God and to your offspring after you. So when God made this promise to Abraham all of these promises bound together. He did so by confirming it with a covenant. The Lord swore and made a covenant. He promised to bless Abraham, to give him land, and to give him an offspring, and in particular, one offspring through whom all the others would be blessed. Now, the book of Hebrews shows us that these promises that Abraham received from God, the promise of the land, for example, was not the land of Canaan in its present state or condition. That when God promised to give Abraham the land of Canaan, Abraham understood that he was not going to receive that land in this life, in his present life. He would receive it 
in the future, in the distant future. Abraham would not receive the promised land of Canaan in its present condition of being under the curse. But after the resurrection, when the earth is renewed, that is when Abraham, in his resurrected body, is going to inherit the land that God had promised. And the offspring that God was promising to give Abraham, it was so large that one couldn't count the number of descendants. Uh, they were as numerous as the dust. And I don't know if anyone's ever tried to count dust or the sand of all the seashores on the earth or the stars of heaven. That's how many children Abraham would have. And that offspring that Abraham considered and looked to as being given to him is really the offspring that we see presented to us in the book of Revelation. In chapter 7 and verse 9, listen to what it says there. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. No one could number. From every nation, from every tribe and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And what do you think of when you think of people who are holding palm branches in their hands before the Lamb of God, Jesus? Does anything come to mind from the Bible? Remember that? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right? Blessed is he. And then you, it brings you right back to the promise of Abraham. Blessed are those who bless you. Cursed are those who curse you. As those who look at this offspring, namely Jesus Christ, Abraham, who comes from you, and they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, the Son of God, came in the name of the Lord, came to save and redeem his people. And all who say of him, blessed is he, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who came, to, came in the name of the Lord. They are blessed along with Abraham. They are his descendants. And that's who Abraham saw when he looked up at the starry night and saw that number too great to count. He was looking at those who would be one day standing and blessing the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, the land. The land wasn't the physical land of Canaan at that time in its present condition. But again, Abraham, when he was told to look north, look south, look east, look west, Everywhere you look, I'm going to give you this land. And Romans chapter 4 says that God had promised Abraham that he would be heir of the world. Heir of the world. But it wasn't the world in its present state. Abraham was looking forward to what we see in Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. This is the land that Abraham was being shown. Again, Hebrews confirms this for us. When Abraham was walking through the land of Canaan during his earthly lifetime, Hebrews tells us that he was actually looking for a heavenly country. He was looking toward the future, toward the time of resurrection and a new heavens and a new earth where the curse is removed. The present earth under the curse passing away. And all being new. Now, of course, this blessing must include favor with God, peace with God. In other words, when we talk about the blessings of salvation, justification, sanctification, the forgiveness of sins. You see, this is the essence of God's covenant promise with Abraham. It's nothing other than the blessings of salvation that are held out in the gospel. 
the blessings of salvation held out in the gospel. Justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification, an enormous amount of fellow believers, a new heavens and a new earth, but most importantly, most importantly, God himself as our inheritance. God as our God and our Father. This is what Abraham was promised. And this blessing was something that he only partially received in this lifetime, namely those blessings of justification, sanctification. He would ultimately receive it in its fullness, receive that fullness of inheritance with the rest of all those who will believe in Christ in the resurrection. Now it's important to understand this. God's promise to Abraham. When God made this promise to Abraham, he was not making two sets of promises to two sets of people. Okay? Sometimes that is <clears throat> thought, uh, that Abraham had two sets of offspring, right? a physical set of offspring and a spiritual set of offspring, and God made two sets of promises spiritual promises to the spiritual offspring and physical promises to the physical offspring. The truth is that all of the promises of God are spiritual in essence because they're all part of the blessing of Abraham. They are all part of the grace and salvation that's bound up in Jesus Christ. Does salvation in Jesus Christ include a land? Yes. A new heavens and a new earth. We'll have a resurrected body on a new earth. Does it include an offspring, a people? Yes. The kingdom of God is made up of all believers throughout all history. All of these things are actually spiritual promises. What is required was faith. Remember, the land of Canaan was promised to be given to Abraham and his descendants, that is, believers, and it was always to be received by faith. Heaven was the true land promised to Abraham and his children, and every physical child of Abraham was Given this promise, though not every child of Abraham received it with faith. It's not that they were given a different promise. It's that they didn't receive the promise they were given by faith. The children of Abraham were promised the new heavens and the new earth. All these blessings of salvation are bound together We might say under the one word, eternal life. Eternal life. And when you think about that blessing, eternal life, what is at its core? Is it it heaven, the new heavens and the new earth? Is that the, the very core of eternal life? Is that the most important thing about eternal life? Is the the new heavens and the new earth and a resurrected body? That certainly is a blessed part of it, but that's not the core. That's not the essence of it. The essence of it, the actual core and blessing of this inheritance, this blessing, is God himself. God himself. That's the essence of eternal life. If you turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, you will see this. Jesus speaking to the woman at the well... And as the woman at the well is thinking about just physical blessings, right? Liquid water from a well that never runs out that you can always draw from or you don't have to keep drawing from it. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. 
The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So you see there the water that Jesus is referring to is a water that is, becomes a well in the heart of a believer that forever satisfies the thirst of our soul. And Jesus explains what this is in chapter 7 of John and verse 37. John chapter 7 and verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood and up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. So the water that Jesus is speaking of, that is a well within the heart, is the Holy Spirit whom believers are to receive. In John chapter 14 and verse 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then in verse 23, he says, Jesus answered him, Anyone who loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. God, the Father, God, the Son, coming to a believer and making their home in him. How? By the Holy Spirit. The experience of God. Fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, is through the Holy Spirit, who becomes a well within the soul, satisfying all of our thirst of the soul. The Holy Spirit brings life. And you see, this is the real essence of the blessing of Abraham. This is the core of the inheritance. God himself, I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. And so you think about that. It's the Holy Spirit coming into a person's heart and life. That is the blessing of Abraham. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is that person who works the mighty works of God, the creative power of God. You remember at creation, it was the Holy Spirit who was hovering upon the waters. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us of sin. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to understand the word of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to believe God's word. So when Paul writes, for example, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to work his good pleasure, he's referring to the Holy Spirit. It's God, the Holy Spirit in you, who is at work. That is the blessing of God. And that's why Paul says again in Romans chapter 8, and verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The Holy Spirit dwelling in our heart. That is the promised blessing to Abraham. The essence of the blessing of Abraham. And so when Paul says in Romans 8, 17, that we are heirs of God, that's our inheritance. God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. This is the same as saying, you are heirs of the Holy Spirit. 
In other words, when God said to Abraham, Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield, I am your exceeding great reward. This is God the Holy Spirit, God himself, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, being enjoyed through the Spirit dwelling in our hearts. That's the blessing of Abraham. Life by the Spirit. And because it's the Holy Spirit who is at work, the inheritance within a believer, think of the implications of that. Total renewal. The ability to overcome all sin and all evil. At one time, Jesus spoke about how difficult it was for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And we know that today. Uh, many believe that they are rich, even if they're not really rich in this world. They think they're rich. And they think they're rich and express that richness by saying in response to the gospel, you know, I don't need that. I'm good. I'm okay. I'm good. Right? Oftentimes, uh, in our street evangelism, when you go to hand out a track, would you like a track? No, thank you. I'm good. I don't need the gospel. But Jesus said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And we know that it's impossible for a camel to go through an eye of, evil, an eye of a needle. And the disciples said that. If they can't be saved, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, the Holy Spirit, all things are possible. And so whenever you think of witnessing, perhaps to a family member who doesn't believe in the Lord, and for years and years they keep rejecting and rejecting and rejecting, well, by the power of the Holy Spirit, they can be made new. When you think of those who are addicted in some terrible addiction, through the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in the heart, those things can be overcome. Nothing can stop the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, this blessing of Abraham, this marvelous inheritance of Abraham, uh, it's declared in the benedictions that God gives, the benedictions of the covenant of grace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance or his face upon you and give you peace. Or the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. This is the blessing of Abraham. Now that's what the blessing of Abraham is. I want us to just very briefly consider how a person receives this blessing. How does it come? How does it come? Now, as you remember, the fundamental error, indeed it's a condemning error, that the Galatians were following, falling into, they were being deceived by, is thinking that the blessing of Abraham comes to us by works of the law. That's how we receive the blessing of Abraham. That eternal life, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, God is our inheritance, that it actually comes to us by what we do, our works, works of the law, doing things to earn the blessing of Abraham. And Paul has been pointing out that this is not the case, and it cannot be the case. He even reminds the Galatians how, how foolish they were. He, he asked them in verse 2, Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Is this how you, is this how you entered into the blessing of Abraham? You received the Holy Spirit. You entered into the blessing of Abraham. Was it by works? Or was it when you heard the gospel and you believed the gospel? If you began by faith, why are you so foolish to think that somehow 
the blessing of Abraham is perfected by what you do. The only way to receive the blessing of Abraham is to receive it precisely the same way that Abraham did, by faith, by believing God's word, by receiving the blessing as a free gift. Did Abraham receive eternal life and the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Did he? No, it's impossible. The law of Moses came 430 years after Abraham. So he didn't receive the blessing by keeping the law of Moses. Did Abraham receive eternal life in the spirit? By being circumcised. No, he couldn't. He had received this blessing 25 years or so before he was circumcised. So it's not by works. It's not by what he did. It's by faith and faith alone. This is the terrible error that you and I can fall into. Remember the Galatians believed at first. They believed and were justified by faith. They were believing Christians, but then they were slipping into this way of thinking. And that's what we all fall into danger uh, concerning this. That we who have begun by faith somehow begin to think, now I have to complete this by my works. And it can never be. It's always a gift. From beginning to end. And that means today, it's a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit. It's something that you can't work for. It's something that God asked you and commands you to receive as a gift. Receive the Holy Spirit and you will be saved. Well, let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> we thank you that you do not lay out for us what is impossible. And that is that we would have to save ourselves through our works. Because we are condemned by this way. We're thankful that the blessing of eternal life, the blessing of Abraham, is something that comes to us as a gift, a word of promise. And you ask us to believe it, and by believing it, we in fact receive it. And, O oh Lord, we pray that you would be pleased through the Holy Spirit to work this great faith that all here would be receiving this marvelous and precious inheritance. <clears throat> Even God dwelling in our hearts, the Holy Spirit. We pray these things in his name. Amen. <clears throat>